tell them to come in. It's okay. <laughs> or I, I will bring the, the clock again. <laughs> Okay, so uh, welcome to the third talk on um, on constraint satisfaction today, given by Fokion Colitis. Uh, thank you, Dan, and let me thank the organizers for, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about this joint work with Alberta Cerias at UPC Barcelona. The topic of this talk has to do with the interplay between local consistency and global consistency. And at an intuitive level, I'd like to illustrate this with these two images. The image on the left is a piece of art. Many of you, if not all, recognize it as the drawing, ascending, and descending of MCSR. Uh, if you look at any particular spot on this drawing, things look perfectly fine. They are perfectly consistent. Yet, the whole image depicts an impossible design. So this is a state of affairs that would be described as being locally consistent, but globally inconsistent. The image on the right, <clears throat> at the first sight, looks almost as paradoxical as the image on the left. Yet, this is something which is physically realized. Perhaps the Greeks in the audience will recognize that this is from Sandorini, the island of Sandorini in Greece. So, we have this interplay between local consistency versus global consistency. And the fact of the matter is that when you go to science, there are several different settings uh, where the objects of study are locally consistent in a way that has to be defined each time, but that they happen to be globally inconsistent. Uh, such settings include a quantum information theory where the term is contextuality, indicating a state of affairs where things are locally consistent but globally inconsistent, probability theory, constraint satisfaction, and database theory. This has given rise to a research program whose goal is to understand the structural aspects of global consistency. To use a nice phrase that I have taken from Samson Abramsky, can we unveil <coughs> the intelligible structure of global consistency? What a nice term. And in particular, closer to what we want to do here, when is local consistency equivalent to global consistency. As it is usually the case, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, an early giant here is Nikolai Vorobiev, uh, who in 1962 characterized when a family of probability distributions defined on overlapping sets of variables has a joint distribution, meaning a distribution whose projections on the corresponding uh, set of variables give you each of the given probability distributions. On the database side, uh, Kadriel Biri, Ron Fagin, David Meyer, and Mihaly Yanakakis in 1983, unaware of the work of Vorobiev, characterized when a family of database relations with overlapping sets of attributes has a universal relation. And the goal of the work that I've done with Albert is to provide a common generalization of the results of Vorobiev and Biri et al. And this is a unifying framework for studying local versus global consistency that uses K relations where K is a positive semi -ring. Now, before getting to the K relations and stating this result that we have, uh, I want to provide some background from database theory, and in particular, make sure that everyone is on the same boat concerning the Biri, Fagin, Mayer, Yanakakis theory. Uh, basic concepts, relations, they have a set of attributes. We will write R parenthesis X to indicate the relation whose sets of attributes, the names of its columns, is the set X. We will write R square bracket Z, where Z is a subset of X, to indicate that uh, this is the projection on R on the attributes of the set Z, and here is an example of taking the projection of the relation R, A, B, C on uh, the attributes A and B. Now come the notions from the Biri, Fagin, Mayer, Yanakakis paper. Uh, two relations are consistent. If there is a relation whose attributes is the union of the sets of attributes of the given relations, so that when you project this relation T 
On X, you get R. When you project it on Y, you get S. And then if you have a family of relations, each with the corresponding sets of attributes, you say that these relations are globally consistent. If there is a master relation over the union of the sets of attributes, such that the corresponding projection of the relation on the set Xi gives you the relation R sub i. It is fairly obvious that if you have a bunch of relations that are globally consistent, then if you take any two of them, they are, pair, they are consistent, they are pairwise consistent. The converse is not true, however. There are many examples of relations which are pairwise consistent, but not globally consistent. To make it concrete, here is an example of four relations over uh, the schemas A1B1, A1B2, A2B1, and A2B2. You can verify they are pairwise consistent, and the little calculation shows that they are not globally consistent. Now you may wonder why I called it Hardy's paradox. Yes? So you were considering safe semantics? <laughs> safe semantics. Set semantics. Yeah. The Biri Fagin will come, <laughs> will come to this later, but this is all about set semantics, yes. Now you may wonder why I called it Hardy's paradox. This is not Hardy, the number theorist uh, who was Ramanujan's advisor. This is the physicist, Lucien Hardy, who in 1993 wrote a very influential paper that gave another version of Bell's theorem. And so this really comes from quantum mechanics. These are the, the, the supports of the probability distributions uh, of some experiments that you can run in quantum mechanics. And they describe a situation where we have a bipartite Bell scenario, Alice and Bob. They do measurements. Each has, can do two measurements. Each measurement has outcome uh, one A or B, uh, one or two outcomes. And this is what comes out. This was his way to give another very compact proof uh, of, Bell's, of Bell's theorem. But I'm not going to go there. I just want to show you that such situations arise naturally in different contexts. So now we come to the crucial definition, which goes back again to Biri et al. Suppose we have a database schema as a collection of sets of attributes. We say that this has the local to global consistency property for relations. If whenever you have a collection of relations that are pairwise consistent, then they happen to be globally consistent. So this is the case where we try to overcome the phenomenon uh, that we have local consistency, but globally consistency. We want to have a setting in which whenever you are locally consistent, you are also globally consistent. Let's look at some examples to make sure that such things exist. If I take this schema with sets of attributes A1, A2, A2, A3, A3, A4, it's easy to verify that this has the local to global consistency property for relations. This is the path schema. On the other hand, this schema, who is the cycle of length four, does not have the local to global consistency property. And I showed you an example. Hardy's, Hardy's paradox is uh, an instance that shows that the local to global consistency property for relations fails up to renaming the names of the attributes, Paris. Is there any reason why we uh, define the local to be pairwise and not like take three, you know, and take if they are consistent? So if you have global consistency, you have like k-wise k consistency for every k less than m, where m is the number of relations, right? The, the local to global was the minimum one, and it works for uh, for this schema, it, it works for higher situations as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So now with this, I can state finally the Biri, Fagin, Mayer, Yanakakis theorem again. Uh, we are looking at schemas. We want the schemas to have the local to global consistency property, meaning there is no difference between local and global cons pairwise consistency and global consistency. Biri Fagin Meir Yanakakis showed that if you are given such a schema, the following five statements are equivalent. Actually, they have like nine statements. I kept just five so that I can fit them on the slide. H is an acyclic hypergraph. What does it mean? 
if I give you such a scheme, I can think of it as a hypergraph whose edges are, whose hyper edges are the sets of attributes. And of course, the vertices are the attributes that I have. So there is a notion of an acyclic hypergraph. This is equivalent to hypergraph being conformal and chordal. I'll define some of these. This is equivalent to H have the running intersection property. This is equivalent to H having a joint tree. And finally, this is equivalent to H having the local to global consistency property for relations. Now, I won't define a cyclic hypergraph and joint tree, but I do want to define conformal and chordal and running intersection property because these are uh, the pieces that we will need to uh, give the for, generalization later on. For Kion, a quick, quick uh, comment question. The first four, pro four properties, they are just properties of acyclicity. They are, have nothing to do with um, uh, local versus global Absolutely. Thank you. It's coming later. You are about five slides ahead of me. Okay. Uh, I will praise and think the appreciation for this theorem and make exactly the point you are making. That these four properties are structural. The fifth property is semantic. The four properties have nothing to do with relations. They are just combinatorial. The fifth, pro the fifth property is semantic. And the beauty of this theorem is showing that these structural combinatorial properties are equivalent to a semantic property. That was exactly right. So what does conformal and chordal mean? If I have a hypergraph, we can associate a graph with this. In finite model theory, we call it the Geifman graph. Here it's called the primal graph. This is the undirected graph whose edges are pairs of nodes that appear together uh, in at least one hyper edge of H. And then we say that the hypergraph is conformal if whenever you have a click in the primal graph, there is some hyper edge that contains this click. I'll give you examples in a minute. And the graph and the hypergraph is chordal if the primal graph is chordal, which means every cycle of length at least four uh, has a chord. It's an adjoining to two knots. I'm sorry. Can, yes. Can you? I, I'm confused. So, so um, regarding this theorem, okay, um, isn't uh, if you take actually, so so there's two directions to the theorem, right? Okay. To the theorem, right? Let me actually take, you know, just you know, property one and property five, okay? Acyclic and 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 and, and uh, local to property, one, right? If it's acyclic, it's obviously local to local property, right? I think this is isn't that an obvious uh, statement? I mean, defense it defense how you define acyclicity. I mean, also well, th things that are obvious to you may or not be obvious to me. What? The one if you define it in theory, right? This is alpha cyclicity. The definition of a cyclicity is quite complicated. I'm not even going to give you the definition of a cyclicity. Joint, join, joint trees is a simple. Okay. Yeah. Take the joint width. Okay. Yes. I mean, going from four to five is, is, is this direction is easy. Right? Yes. And the other direction, if you have this Hardy example, you can always take this and generate a you know basically a, you know a, a, a proof out of this. Right. You've done that. It's right? more complicated than that. Believe it's more complicated than that. Uh, it, it actually, uh, the Hardy's example plays a role, not, on, not, not just the Hardy's example, but a collection of Hardy type examples. It's a minimal, Hardy's example is a minimal violation of cordiality, the hypergraph, I mean, but there are others. And you need also minimal counter examples to conformality. I'm happy to discuss it. Um, so, Anyway, the, the hypergraph is conformal if every click is contained in some hyper edge, it's chordal if, if the primal graph is chordal. So this hypergraph, which is the, which is the path of length three, uh, is both conformal and chordal. Uh, there is basically a path. Uh, the clicks are just edges here. So uh, there is nothing more to this. This example is conformal but not chordal because we, we have a cycle of length four but no chord. Uh, this example, going back to uh, related to uh, what uh, Christoph said, uh, this is the path, uh, the path 
schema of which we have spent, the triangle schema of which we have spent a great deal of time talking about here. Uh, this is chordal but not conformal. Uh, it is it's chordal because it has cycle, the no cycle, no, no cycle of length fall. The primal graph is a click, but the click is not contained in nets. The nets. So you have to deal with this case also. It's not just uh, the it is not just Hardy's uh, the hyper gap behind Hardy. So the running intersection property. So I explained what conformal and and uh, and chordal means. The hypergraph has a running intersection property. If there is an ordering of the hyper edges such that for every i less than n, there is a j less than i, so that xi intersection with all uh, the, the union of all sets of attributes of smaller index is contained in xj. So that's the running intersection property. If you have a running intersection property, yes, you, it's easy to, and they are pairwise consistent, it's easy to build a big relation that uh, witnesses the consistency, and you, you do a proof uh, of global consistency by induction. This schema we saw before, the path of length three, has the running intersection property. The cycle of length four does not have the running intersection property. You go happily along uh, up to this point when you throw this one. This one is not contained uh, in the intersection of one of the previous. Uh, there's no previous one such that A4, A1 is contained in the intersection with the union. So chordal uh, graphs have the property that you can always find a kink, and if you remove that kink, it remains crooked. Say that again, please. If you remove the kink, chordal graphs have the property that, they, that you can always find a kink. Yes. And removal of that kink, it remains, after removal of that kink, it remains crooked. Yes. What are the kinks corresponding to here? The kinks so are just the edges here. What? what you mean for this one? Well, that, that there is obvious that there's no kink. They don't have to be, you can't find a kink that you can remove. It's a cycle. It's a cycle, yeah. So, what? I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood your question, uh, Peter. Sorry. You can always think of them as graphs and they have a kink. Yes. Yes. You find a click, which when you remove it, the graph remains called. Like each has edges of click in, in the primal graph. Right? It's a primal graph. This is that is the graph. It's the, the, the clicks are the primal. Uh, is that right? Uh, the edges correct. Uh, the clicks, right? I can take them out and yeah. get the primal graph. I see. Got it. Yeah. We 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 talk about the schema being uh, conformal or chordal by reflecting on the primal graph of the schema. All right, so now uh, let me restate the theorem and make exactly the point that uh, Dan made that uh, these four properties are structural notions, the fifth property is a semantic notion, and the, this theorem tells you that the semantic property is equivalent to any of these four structural properties. Just to appreciate the algorithmic consequence of this, if I gave you this as a definition and asked you to tell, given a hypergraph, does it have a local to global consistency property? On the face of it, you have to examine all relations. But this translated, trans says you, there is a simple algorithm, I mean, computing a joint tree, telling if it has joint tree and so on. All right, now with all this background, I want to go to, go to K relations. We've seen a lot of positive semi rings. And we know that positive semi rings are everywhere. So these are some of the examples we saw this morning. So what is a K relation? Uh, forgive me, sorry. I don't think we have, we know what a positive semi ring is. Oh, I thought, so Dan did not define this. Uh, uh, well, Dan, a positive semi ring is a semi ring that has these two properties. Uh, plus positive means that if A plus B is zero, then A is zero and B is zero. And a times B0 implies that A0 or B0, no zero divisors. The way to think about it is the plus positivity ensures that the sum of non-zero elements is always non-zero. And no zero divisors ensures that if a product is zero, at least one of the factors has to be zero. So this is, uh, and we need both of these properties for the, uh, for the results. 
Herring. Yeah, that's why I stay away from groups. <laughs> the semi-ring with stool indeterminate. Yeah. Same Another example. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay, so positive semi-rings are everywhere. <laughs> uh, a K relation is simply what a, an ordinary relation where you have annotations coming from a semi-ring. Formally, it's a function from a K tuples, from N tuples. Uh, to the same meaning K that has finite support. So it is uh, zero everywhere except for a finite set. Uh, relations are B relations over the Boolean semi ring. Bugs or multisets are N relations over the semi ring of the integers. Very important when we reconcile back with Vorobiev theorem, probability distributions of finite support are uh, R plus relations, that's the semi, the non the semi ring of the non negative numbers, with a side condition that the sum of the annotations is one. Now, I want to define the notion of consistency for K relations. That's where our work begins. We want to generalize the biri fagin meyer yanakakis theorem and then the Vorobiev theorem. So we need the notion of consistency of relations. This will be done by introducing first an equivalence relation. So we are now having K relations over a semi-ring and we say these two relations are equivalent if there are non-zero elements so that when you multiply uh, the first relation by A and you multiply the second relation by S, you get B. And what do I mean by multiplication? AR is simply the K relation such that every annotation is multiplied by A. Uh, this is an equivalence relation that's easy to check. Let's look what happens for Boolean relations, they are equivalent if and only if they are equal. Not true for bugs. Okay, take a bug, multiply all the multiplicities by the same number, you get an equivalent relation, but they are not equal. An equivalent bug, but they are not equal. On the other hand, uh, if I have two probability distributions of finite support, then they are equivalent in the sense if and only if they are equal. That's a little exercise using the fact that the sum of the probabilities is one. Moreover, if I give you some relation over the semi ring of the non negative reals, then there is a probability distribution of finite support that's equivalent to it. This is simply normalizing, dividing by the sum of the notations that we have. So every equivalence class in the uh, semi ring of non negative reals contains a probability distribution. That's also important for the connection to Borovia. And now we can give the definitions as we had before. We, if we have a bunch of K relations, we say they are globally consistent. If there is a big relation whose projections now are equivalent to each of the given relations. So we have replaced equality by equivalence. In the case of Boolean relations, it's the old definition. We have the notion of pairwise consistency. In the sense, if they are globally consistent, they are pairwise consistent. The converse is not true in general because it's not true even the Boolean relations. So with this now, I can state our main theorem, which is what you, the theorem we had before, except now we are talking about an arbitrary positive semi-ring, and we are talking about the local to global consistency property for K relations, which means that every pairwise consistent collection of K relations is globally consistent. So the statement is what we had before with Fagin, Biri, uh, Meyer, and Yanagakis, except now we are working with the K relations of an arbitrary positive semi-ring. And here we have the notion of local to global consistency for K relations. The difference, one of the differences, as we saw before, that global consistency means the projections are not equal, they are up, they are equivalent, they are in the same equivalence class. Uh, the proof has different architecture than the BFMY theorem. Uh, one direction requires to show, I mean, in one direction, we saw that if H has the running intersection property that I showed you before, uh, then the H has the local to global consistency property for K relations. The second step is that if it's not conformal or not cordial, then it does not have the local 
to global consistency property for K relations. And of course, we are, we are appealing to the four combinatorial characterizations of, uh, of a cyclistic. Uh, the straightforward direction, relatively straightforward, is the running intersection property. If we have a running intersection property, we have a local to global consistency. As you go along, though, you need to define the join in the setting. I'm not going to give you a definition of join. I'm, I'm going to say it's not the obvious one. If you just multiply the multiplicity, the, the values, it doesn't work. You have to do something more sophisticated. I, I don't have time to get into this. The other direction is perhaps uh, more interesting. This is in the spirit of what Christoph uh, commented. If H is not conformal or H is not chordal, then it contains a simple induced hypergraph, which is either a minimal violation of being conformal or a minimal violation for being chordal, one of the cycles. There is a reduction that says if you have a local to global consistency property for K relations, then so do for some age, then so do the above simple induced hypergraphs. And now the key part is that when you look at this type of hypergraphs, then these do not have a local to global consistency property for K relations. The proof in the BFMY or, or even in Vorobiev doesn't where you can't use those relations. Uh, we cook up uh, explicitly construct K relations that are pairwise consistent, not globally consistent. The construction is inspired uh, by proof complexity, by Chaitin's uh, hard to prove tautologies. And that's what I will say about this. So here is the main theorem again. Uh, H is an acyclic hypergraph if and only if H has the local to global consistency property for relations. By specializing to the Boolean semi-ring and to the semi-ring of the positive non-negative reals together with the observation that every equivalence class there contains a probability distribution. You have that as a corollary, H is an acyclic hypergraph, if and only if H has a local to global consistency property for relations, if and only if H has a local to global consistency property for probability distributions of finite support. So they are both special case of this single theorem. The equivalence one and two is the BFMY. What does this have to do with Vorobiev's work? I haven't told you yet was Vorobiev's theorem in precise terms. Vorobiev in 1962, that's 20 plus years before BFMY, saw that the following are equivalent for a schema H. The hypergraph is regular. And H has the local to global consistency property for probability distributions of finite support. What is regularity? I'm not going to define the notion. It's akin to Graham's uh, algorithm for eliminating hyperedges in a hypergraph. But in the paper, we give a direct proof that H is regular if H is a cyclic. So, so that's, these are two combinatorial notions. So Vorobiev's theorem and the BFMY theorem are instances of a single unified result, which is what we wanted to do. Uh, this work appeared in a volume that just got published in honor of Samson Abramsky in Outstanding Contributions to Logic. And now I want to take a couple of minutes and finish by describing ongoing work. Uh, you can step back and see what did we really use from the positive semi-ring. Well, the definition of projection uses only addition, no multiplication. And it's important that it's positive because otherwise, if you did not have a positive semi-ring, the support of a projection would be different than the support of the relation you started with. Things look really bad. Where did we use multiplication? Obviously, we used it in the definition of the equivalence relation because it said A times R equal B times S. We also used it in the definition of the join operation, which I didn't show you. But this made us wonder what happens if I don't have the multiplicative structure? I only have a positive monoid, an operation which is commutative, associative, and positive. No, no, the sum of two 
uh, non-zero elements, always non-zero. Now we can have a stricter notion of consistency, which actually captures the consistency for bugs. Two relations are strictly consistent if there is a K relation whose projections are the actual relations, not up to equivalence as we had before. This is now perfectly meaningful for positive monoids. So we can define analogously the notions of strict global consistency and strict local to global consistency for monoids. So we are almost done writing this new paper. Uh, we have that if you have the strict local to global consistency property for K relations for a most positive monoid, then it must be acyclic. So it's a generalization of its side in construction that I alluded to before. But, but there are positive monoids and acyclic hypergraphs that don't have the local to global consistency property for K relations. So the easy direction uh, goes bad here. The easier direction goes bad. In fact, this happens even for the path schema. There are positive monoids for which uh, you don't have, you have three relations in the path schema. They are pairwise consistent. They are not globally consistent in a strict sense. We have succeeded in characterizing the positive monoids for which every acyclic hypergraph has a strict uh, local to global consistency property. So we know we have a combinatorial characterization of this. The upshot now is that we can forget semi-rings and go to positive monoids and we have a new framework for the study of local versus global consistency. I thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, so now we go through the same uh, the same thing that we went before. We have half an hour for extensive discussions. Oh boy, who was first, um, Erich? What puzzles me is that the structural property does not depend on the semi ring at all, right? It just depends on the hypergraph. Yes. So uh, it would mean that if you have the local to global consistency for some hypergraph, then you have it for all. No, no, you want to have it for every hypergraph. Yes, but uh, the, the, this is see, see, condition one. Yes. Depend at all on the, on the semi ring? It doesn't depend on semi ring, no. So if, if, if you have this local to global consistency for some semi ring, then you have it for yes, all. Yes, that's, 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 that's exactly what it says, yes. So, but a subordinate semi ring is also a semi ring, so. Yes, and that's, that's exactly why the Greece, that's exactly why it generalizes. The, 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 there is no difference between the Boolean and arbitrary positive semi rings here as regards the local to global consistency problem. That's what the theorem says. Okay. Okay. I'm um, not sure. Um, um, Stefan? No, yes. Uh, maybe I missed something. I'm wondering if there is some relation between the notion of K anonymity, using and security, and this notion of strict uh, local and global uh, consistency. I know the notion of k-anonymity. It was one of the early attempts to privacy, but it didn't go very well. I mean, it went. Uh, yeah, I have talked to Bayardo about this a long time ago. Uh, I don't see it right away, but maybe we can discuss it. Yeah, Christoph. So in that uh, uh, probabilistic uh, version of the, of the problem, yes. yeah. Um, so in the concept of contingency tables, you know, people have this technique called iterative proportional fitting, right? But it basically, know, uh, so 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 you have a number of tables, the probability distributions, right? That are you know yes. marginalized from a big thing, but they they are noisy, so they are in general inconsistent in, in such a way they cannot move a single probability table or all the or all the random variables, yes. right? But usually the, the assumption is that you got them by sampling and stuff like that, and and, and they're not totally wrong, right? And case is technical in terms of proportional fitting for reconstructing the, the global the universal relation, yes. And there's results about this that it converges for a large class of things and you can get, get, get a maximum entropy solution. Right? Yes. So the question is that I have is there some version that you know generalization of the technique to you know doing the semi ring on, 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 on other semi ring. Right? <laughs> but yes. you're not familiar with this with really, there's no But I just just a comment at the high level uh, 
we want the local to global consistent property to hold for every collection of relations, right? This is a different from the yeah, from the decision. Yeah. This is different from the universal relation problem, yeah. where you don't care what the schema is. You say, I give you a bunch of relations. They are pairwise consistent. Are they globally consistent? Yeah. Okay. So I understand we, that this is kind of a static property. This is a static property. Exactly, this is a static property. Yeah. Uh, it is, of course, it is interesting only when you have situations where local consistency does not imply global consistency. Yeah. Uh, and the problem is by the old papers by uh, Johnson, Yanakakis, and uh, Honeyman, right? It is it is a NP complete to check for the, the for the existence of the universal relation. So, which of the two problems you have in mind? This question or or the or the, the you, it sounded like you are asking about the I'm asking the per instance version of this, right? Per yeah, that, that says nothing about the query instance, right? I mean, this is a property, this is static, as you said, aptly, it's a static property of the entire schema. My question is basically, have you thought about this? Because this is a technique that might be generalized beyond probability distributions to kind of no, uh, other weights to your tuples. Yeah, the, it, but since you mentioned entropy in the uh, in the paper, we have a section where we try to give some justification for the choice of the join, because there are many joins you can select here. And we connected it to a maximum entropy kind of, of result. And the related this, this was related to some earlier work by Marles Tuto in the 80s on entropy and the, and the join. Uh, but I don't know if it's related to this, I just want to mention. But just a quick, quick, quick question to you, Christoph. So when you- I don't know the answers to it. <laughs> Uh, but when you compute IPF, uh, you, isn't the assumption that you start from a set of consistent marginal distributions? Well, in the stuff that you and I have done, we do that, right? But this so, thing has to develop for the general scenario where these things are actually inconsistent. But, okay. but then you get something. It's not widely inconsistent, right? Okay. They're not like, you know, you know the diagonalized worst case examples, but you're talking about things where you basically you know, have different ways of basically, you know, uh, you know uh, creating samples or something like that, and basically reconstructing these different marginal tables, right, for which you want to build the global big one, right? I, I agree. It's an, it's an interesting connection. They're always inconsistent, Good. I think. Yes, Deepa. Uh, for the consistency of a monoid that you uh, mentioned at the end, so is there a connection with the normal forms? Is it a weaker notion than normal normal form? Uh, say, joint dependency or like even BCF. And, in general, is there a concept for normal forms over severity? I don't know how to answer the question. I haven't thought about normal connection. It's like in the table that, like on the projection, uh, uh, there is this table T, and on individual relations, they are giving. Yeah, but that's that's the universal relation. That that, that that's not. That, that is not related to normal. Well, the universal relation goes back. Uh, to, to the universal relation model that Ted Codd fought so hardly. I mean, I, uh, it's the idea that uh, all my relations are projections of a master relation. Uh, Jeff Ullman describes it as the first uh, data integration model. Okay. Uh, and I think that's the motivation.